This is a production of Cornell University. I'm very pleased to introduce um, the, our visiting A.D. White Professor at Large, Sri Kulkarni. I should probably introduce myself because my, not all of you may know me. I'm James Lloyd uh, from the Department of Astronomy. Um, so I actually didn't know a lot about the, the A.D. White program uh, until quite recently, and I thought I would look up uh, exactly what this program was all about. And apparently President White, when the university was first founded, expressed concern that Cornell's first faculty remote from great cities and centers of thought and action, might lose connection with the world at large, save through books, bred in and in and become provincial in spirit. And to help ensure this would not happen, he proposed the establishment of a system of non-resident professors selected for their distinguished achievements in diverse disciplines and walks of life, who would visit the university periodically over extended periods of time, and under this system, the resident professors would be thrown into close relations um, at once with the special professors, and their views would be enlarged, their efforts stimulated, their whole life quickened. And so this is the, the, the purpose of the A.D. White uh, program. And uh, our visiting A.D. White professor, uh, Sri Kulkarni, is indeed a very distinguished uh, professor of, with, with many achievements. I'll give a couple of quick highlights. He is currently the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Professor of Astronomy and Planetary Science uh, at the California Institute of Technology. Uh, his research interests are in compact, compact objects, neutron stars, millisecond pulsars, gamma ray bursts, and the search for extrasolar planets. He received uh, his first degree an MS in Physics from the Indian Institute of Technology and his PhD in Radio Astronomy from UC Berkeley. And then he moved to Caltech as a Millikan Fellow and has been on the faculty since 1987. He's a Fellow of the National Academy of Sciences, was a, has been a Jansky Lecturer, a Fellow of the Royal Society, a Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's received the Alan T. Waterman Award of the National Science Foundation, the Helen Warner Prize of the American Astronomical Society, the Packard Fellowship, and the Vainu Bapu Award, amongst others. And Sri gave a lecture to my introductory astronomy class, Astronomy 101, uh, on Monday, and I, you know, I realised that most of these the undergraduates in this class would not know what most of these awards were, and so I told them that the way to understand exactly how famous Sri is is that Sri is so famous he is known by his first name alone. So he is as famous as Madonna, <laughs> at least in the world of astronomy. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce Sri, uh, turn over the podium to him, so that you might have your views enlarged your efforts stimulated and your whole life quickened. Thanks. Uh, sorry about the, the startup. I have no idea. We, we had three Macintoshes and several combinations of dongles, and I think we hit upon the right one. Um, the isolation of Cornell, uh, it may happen. Uh, if US Air goes out of business, uh, uh, you guys, and uh, since there's no trains anymore, it, it may happen uh, within this year, Jamie. Okay, so you should make use of me as much as you can. But the part that I was a little struck by, I had not appreciated the clause, is why all professors thrown at once at this one person? Uh, that seemed uh, a bit unfair. Okay, uh, I, I thought I'll tell you a little bit about uh, uh, progress in, in uh, cosmic explosions, um, which sounds like a rather um, esoteric topic. Uh, but as a famous astronomer here once remarked, Carl Sagan, you know, we're all the children of, of, uh, of star, stardust, and uh, explosions are, are why you're here. So you all should appreciate stars explode. Otherwise, uh, we'd have a universe full of hydrogen, helium, a little lithium, and that's about it. Okay. So uh, here's what astronomers think of uh, uh, a complete uh, 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 history of the universe. You start off with hydrogen, uh, some matter, mainly hydrogen, helium. And what's shown is redshift at the top uh, right. And uh, this matter has, en and there's some energy thrown in there. Uh, Self-gravity plays a big role. Matter gets clumped and soon gets clumped on a variety of scales and stars are formed. And uh, uh, as the stars undergo nuclear fusion in the center, they explode, uh, most of them in early on. 
and it is the remnants of this explosion which gives rise to elements beyond lithium. Um, occasionally, I make a joke uh, uh, to, uh, I don't necessarily sort of do it uh, thinking of someone in particular, but in, in my department, I say, well, thank God for some of us here that you know, nature produced some lithium. Uh, lithium is, is a one, it's, very, it's a very fragile thing, so it can only destroy. Stars don't make lithium, and I can assure you some of my colleagues would be hard-pressed without uh, this uh, conspiracy of nature. Okay, so what you saw was, uh, was uh, how this matter, which is not uniformly distributed, uh, then uh, uh, goes into this dramatic growth where uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, almost uniformly distributed then becomes clumps, which in, in this case are, are the galaxies. So let me show you another version of this, uh, which is a higher resolution. Uh, might be that, oops. Okay, we, since we had to do a lot of this transfer, it might be this movie uh, got lost. So let me see if I can play this again. Oh, I guess. Okay, well, I'm afraid I have to show that movie only once. So what you saw there was uh, a formation all the way from high rate shift to now, and other uh, explosions all the time in the universe. Uh, just to give you a sense, uh, uh, these roughly once a second there's a star that dies somewhere in the universe. Explosion, explosion, explosion. Um, and uh, um, so I'd like to tell you a little bit about some of these uh, explosions. Most of these are ordinary supernovae. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, that's been sort of the mainstay of astronomy for almost now a century, for almost a century. And these explosions then produce this complicated uh, or heavier elements. We get Earth, and as I remarked in Jamie's class, uh, uh, really uh, planets are really the dregs of star formation. You know, when you form stars, you get a little bit of stuff left over, and it's sort of the placental material, a little bit condenses, you get planets. So it's sort of a, it's not exactly pr quality real estate we are supposed to be living on. This is literally the dregs. Okay, so I thought maybe you should, uh, I should uh, give you some background. Uh, and uh, so I think there are a few things I want to know. Uh, uh, one is uh, uh, <clears throat> any large object, if it is sufficiently large, will collapse under its own weight. Uh, you know, you could maybe think of some of your colleagues and have that in mind. It, no, it's not that. You, you have to be really large, okay? Um, and uh, uh, so the question is, if the sun, if it is so large, uh, so much mass, why isn't it collapsing? Well, it's not collapsing because there's something to prevent the collapse, namely you have an in, uh, pressure gradient. There's a higher pressure in the center compared to the surface. So the inward gravitational attraction is compensated by something which is pushing it out exactly, precisely. That's why the sun is stable for a very long time, almost about eight billion years. The sun is in precise equilibrium, okay? What, how, what provides this inverse gradient I was talking of? Well, in the case of sun, we have high pressure due to nuclear fusion in the center. Well, that right away tells you why, you, why stars die because after a while the, the uh, fusion, uh, the, the material for fusion, uh, namely hydrogen, you run out of that, and then the star has to start its collapse. Um, we now know that these stars, once the fuel, hydrogen, is exhausted, these stars now become one of three kinds, a white dwarf, which is the fate of our sun. Uh, it's mass of uh, the sun, but ra radius of Earth. Uh, it's, uh, it's the fate of many stars, especially in this generation of stars. Uh, neutron star, these are similar mass, except they're made of uh, neutrons, much, much smaller radius, only 10 kilometers in size. And ultimately, black holes, if, if in fact, the, the, if the remaining core has got a mass which is more than two times the mass of sun. Okay, these are the compact objects, uh, the remnants left over after the stars, uh, stars die. Okay, well, now to understand the explosion part, uh, you, have to, you have to know uh, there's gravitational binding energy, which sounds very fancy, but, you know, so here's, uh, uh, I have this object here, and I drop it, and uh, there's obviously energy uh, that's gained just for falling through this, and, and that's sort of gravitational binding energy, which means if I want to take Earth apart, I'll have to actually do some work because uh, 
uh, everything is sticking to each other because of gravitational force. So this binding energy is inversely, inversely proportional to the size of the, of, the, of, the, of the source of the star. And that's why I was particular in giving you the sizes of these stellar remnants. A white dwarf has the size of Earth, neutron star the size of Ithaca plus environs. And uh, a black hole is only a few kilometers in that sense, an effective size. Uh, so they produce, if you, so their, their very production leads to a large amount of energy. And conversely, just like this example I gave you, um, when, I, when I do drop and it hits, it goes down into the gravitational potential, you gain energy. And in the same way, when material forms onto these objects, you also gain energy. So you gain energy twice. One, when you form it, because you've got starting from a large star and becoming a small star. And the other one is as you keep dumping matter, which is called accretion power. In fact, the realization that accretion power is is in fact the dominant source of energy in the universe uh, took place here by Professor Saul Peter in the early 60s. Okay, so uh, after these explosions, you get supernovae, and here you can see that there's a, a supernova remnant 400 years old now, and actually, if you take a Chandra image, it, you can see it's, it's, uh, it's a cosmic advertisement. There's a lot of calcium you actually see. Okay, it's, the, the words aren't there. I, I, I'm pretty sure no one got fooled by that, but that is actually calcium you're seeing, okay? So the, the, when these sorts of stars die, they produce things like calcium, but the other kinds of stars, when they die, they produce iron, and that's terribly important for us because it's only when you start producing those you go beyond that group of elements. Okay, so uh, that's sort of a broad history, okay? So to summarize, universe starts off hydrogen, helium, energy, and because it's not absolutely homogeneously distributed, you get this gradual growth of structures, okay? So it's sort of a curious thing. If the universe were formed perfectly symmetrically, that is the density here is the same as density there, you'd get the universe would be just, nothing would happen in this universe. It would just expand. So it's, this, uh, it's a curious thing. Uh, most of the interesting things in the universe are due to slight asymmetries, okay? Anyway, I'll, I'll leave you with some sort of zen-like uh, thinking that you may want to do about that. Okay, then we get these explosions. Explosions generate elements uh, that may make up a large part of our, uh, our constitution. And uh, unless these explode, unless the stars can go and see the interstellar medium, uh, it's not very useful. If a star just, uh, all the material advects or just goes into the remnant star, it's, uh, the composition of the universe doesn't change. But all these things do happen, okay? So let me start with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, sort of the, the big change that uh, has happened in the last 40 years or something. Uh, and the first one I'd like to talk about is gamma ray bursts, because uh, <clears throat> these are the most exotic explosions. So while there's one supernova every second that's happening somewhere in the universe, probably there's, uh, our guess is there's probably one every thousand seconds uh, of gamma ray bursts, okay? maybe one every 10,000 seconds. And just to give you an idea, uh, a day has 10 to the five seconds, 100,000. So gamma ray bursts are rare, uh, but they're very dramatic. So these were discovered by, in the early, in the, in the, actually in the, in the mid 60s, because uh, the US and then U, uh, USSR signed a treaty called the Outer Space Treaty, which prohibited testing of nuclear devices above ground. Uh, if you have a nuclear explosion, uh, you will produce hard x-rays, okay? So uh, <clears throat> in order to verify that there won't be tests in space as opposed to just say so, uh, atmospheric tests, uh, the two countries built these satellites which carried these hard x-ray detectors to in fact verify, to make sure that there's compliance that there are no nuclear tests carried out in outer space. Uh, by the way, this Outer Space Treaty was the first time which actually lays down on ownership of asteroid material and so on and so forth. Um, that, uh, uh, it's a curious document actually worth revisiting. So what these people found, uh, what the strong, or the people who built this found is in fact they did find hard X-ray bursts or gamma ray bursts. And it turned out to be not of terrestrial origin. It's fairly easy to, uh, to prove that. And so just imagine this is Earth and there's this satellite circling around. Now let's say there's a gamma ray burst in that direction. Now, uh, the, uh, if I have a, the, there's a constellation of satellites. So if there's a satellite on this side of Earth and another one on that side, 
it's pretty clear if a burst is coming from that direction that the gamma ray burst reaches this satellite first on my, on, on my right side, and then uh, it reaches the other one a little later because light takes a certain time to travel, which is tens of milliseconds in this case, which is good enough to do triangulation and show that this is of, uh, uh, of uh, extraterrestrial origin. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, well, um, so this was towards the end of 60s that the results were announced. Uh, and uh, the origin of these objects uh, is very, very, very mysterious, for, or was very mysterious for almost 30 years. Uh, so much so that a major uh, satellite, uh, uh, one of its main purposes was, in fact, to uh, understand the origin of gamma ray bursts. So here's the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory being launched in the uh, early 90s. This is a very large uh, spacecraft. Uh, it's, a large, it's the largest civilian uh, spacecraft to be launched. And you can see this from the shuttle uh, uh, bay. And this is the size of a school bus, just to give you a sense of how big this is. And it carried a number of experiments, and one of it was to study gamma ray bursts. OK, so what, what astronomers found, uh, until then it was known, but this, this uh, mission really showed very well is, Gamma ray bursts are, in fact, isotropic. So what does the word isotropic here mean? Is that the chance of seeing a gamma ray burst is the same in this direction or in that direction or any other direction, OK? <clears throat> and the number, uh, the rate as seen by this uh, experiment called BATSI was uh, a few a day, one a day or, or so. So once a day, there's a blinding flash of gamma ray bursts, and it's random in the sky, random time, random location. And this is shown in a particular coordinate system in which the stars uh, would lie along the equator, okay? Uh, this is called a galactic coordinate system. The center of a galaxy would lie here. And if I showed you the optical picture, which it will be on the next view graph, you'll find most of the stars will be here. And uh, so if gamma ray bursts came from ordinary stars, then you expect they too would be lined up with, uh, along the equator as the other stars are. Uh, instead, you can find it's, it's perfectly distributed on the sky. So here's an artist's sketch of what our uh, galaxy would look if you went outside the galaxy and looked at it sideways. Uh, here's the center of the galaxy. The galaxy is primarily a disk of stars, a very thin disk, uh, with some old stars in a sort of spherical distribution. And the sun is located out here, uh, not particularly uh, a special place. We are not in the center of the galaxy. We are not way out of the galaxy. We are sort of somewhere in between. Uh, <clears throat> and you can see that if, if gamma ray bursts were distributed like the stars, then they, that uh, uh, their distribution of the sky cannot be isotropic. In fact, it's very easy. You go out, especially in the northern hemisphere, you, you go out in summertime, you see a band of, mil of, of stars, the Milky Way. And that's simply looking towards uh, uh, in the, into the galactic equator. In the southern sky, it's even more spectacular. OK, so we have these very mysterious sources that are a few times a day. They're very bright. If you could see these bursts with your eyes, which we don't, and uh, towards the end, if I have some time, I'll, I'll explain it's how fortunate is it that we don't see gamma ray bursts at Earth. And, uh, uh, and their origin is random, anywhere in the sky. So you need a model for this, obviously not stars. So obviously you need something which one idea is, uh, we know it is not stars because there are more stars in this part of the sky compared to that. So what if I hypothesize that the, there's a, 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 a very big di a sphere around us, a corona, a crown, okay, uh, in which there are these mysterious objects lurking around and then they burst and because it's so big, the sphere, compared to the, my offset from, from the center of this galaxy, I won't notice. The statistics will be such that I'll say, ah, it's more or less iso uh, isotropic. Well, it's possible, except uh, it's very mysterious. As this artist sketch shows, it, it tries to show you all the things we know, mostly in the disk, a few things so-called halo, and we have nothing here. So then you have to come up. So in the mid-90s, you know, uh, physics, uh, it's slightly better today, but physics for a long time since I would say maybe late 60s has been a very boring field. Uh, nothing much happens uh, in, in that field. So there are a lot of those guys sort of read astronomy papers, and they wrote many articles. Ah, oh, well, maybe there's some weird cosmic strings colliding with each other, uh, phase transitions, whatever. Uh, all wrong, OK, all wrong. Uh, that's, uh, and, uh, but that didn't make sense, um, uh, even uh, with, the, with, with the minute of uh, reading. 
the other big sphere, there's one other big sphere here which I haven't plotted, and that is the universe. Uh, the, we, all, uh, we now know it's, uh, that there are as many galaxies in any direction as any other. Okay, and this is in fact the basis, this is the ultimate Copernican revolution that we have no preferred status in the universe at all. Well, the problem here is that if you put gamma ray bursts in the universe on the largest sphere we know of, okay, which is the entire universe, then I'm still receiving this blinding flash here at Earth, but now I'm going to make the distance very far away across the universe, and then you know the famous candle inverse square law experiment. Uh, I'm pretty sure we all did in third grade or fourth, I forget. You know, you take the candle, you measure how much flux there is, and you then go further away, the flux decreases. And so it decreases as one over distance square. So if I have the same, I have flux, and I want to say how much was that candle, I have to multiply by distance square. If I make the distance as large as the size of the universe, this is an astounding number. How, how astounding it is? Well, it'll be something in astronomer units, 10 to the 54 ergs per second. Uh, makes no sense at all, uh, uh, because it's one followed by 54 zeros. But let me put it another way. If you take the entire mass of sun, the solar mass of sun, and you find another anti-sun, anti-matter stuff, and put them together, you'll know E equals mc squared stuff comes out, energy comes out. That's what happens in one second, the total annihilation of a solar mass of material in one second. That is an impressive thing. Now, most astronomers, we are used to very large numbers. Uh, it's uh, 10 to the 54, it's no big deal. We, we can really handle very large numbers. Unfortunately, the only large number we don't handle is our paychecks, which tend to be uh, more modest. Um, God, this is a very tough crowd. Okay, I'll try harder. Okay, so uh, this is a large number for astronomers. This is very challenging. Ten, uh, bashing of a whole sun in a second, yeah, no one knows how to do that, really. Okay, so that was a problem. So, so much so that astronomers had a meeting in Washington. I went to that, you can see, April 22nd, 1995. It was a, a, a room like this, uh, except there are two big aisles uh, and uh, a somewhat sm smaller central aisle, if I remember right. And he wore a button, one which says gamma rays are galactic, which means they belong to this mysterious population of, in the corona. Or they're cosmologic, which means they're somewhere out there in the cosmos. And if you really didn't know which one you, you collected, you had, wore the button other. Uh, I'm always a, a, a very practical guy. I collected them all. I didn't have a particular basis because, you know, it's always good. If you want to trade, you should always have complete sets. It, everyone understands this. So uh, anyway, these are collector items. If you're interested, we can negotiate after the talk. Uh, I have them. And uh, let me give the punchline away of wh where this talk is going. Uh, the answer is uh, uh, all these three buttons are right. Uh, uh, in 1995, which is a you know, little bit over a decade ago, we thought there's only one button which is right. And it turns out, you know, 13 years later, all buttons are right. You know, that's the beauty of astronomy that the uh, universe is actually much more imaginative than, than uh, astronomers can be. Okay, so in the next uh, 10 slides or so, I'll tell you what caused this modest revolution uh, in, in what is considered as a first-class mystery in astronomy for nearly four decades. Okay, so the revolution came about unexpectedly, actually, with the launch of an Italian-Dutch satellite called Beppo Sachs. Uh, Occellini, who's a a nickname was Beppo, uh, Italian uh, physicist who almost missed uh, discovering the, the anti-electron, actually. Uh, uh, he's well known in, in more technical circles for inventing what is called as a coincidence, uh, uh, what we now consider as uh, both coincidence and anti-coincident techniques, which sound obvious, but it wasn't so obvious till his, till his invention. Anyway, so the Italian Dutch satellite uh, uh, carried um, an X-ray imager and a gamma ray detector. So um, uh, this X-ray, uh, two X-ray images. So basically, uh, the problem with gamma rays is that at such high energies, uh, the energies of these gamma rays we are talking of is about oh, 100 to 1,000 times larger than the energy of the X-ray you get when you go to your dentist, okay? Um, X-rays uh, can can be made. Uh, you can you can you can make uh, reflective optics with X-rays, but gamma rays are so energetic and so small. Effectively, it's hard to make reflective optics. So you can't make images at gamma ray wavelengths. 
So the, that's why you couldn't figure out, you know roughly where it is, but to, in order to really figure out, you have to make images with a high precision, with very high resolution, and that is not possible. But anyway, so this, uh, this satellite, uh, they were able to find, in fact, a gamma ray burst goes off, then use X-ray as a different technique, find likely uh, fading counterparts, use another telescope, and then find a final localization. And once you had that, the game, game really uh, became very interesting. So that's called the afterglow. Afterglow phenomena is the burst goes off, and then you get low energy radiation, X-ray, optical radio, for many days, which allows you to then uh, go and conduct studies. So um, one of our, the things that we did early on was this gamma ray burst 970508. Uh, these, uh, these are, uh, this is the gamma ray bur uh, bursts are known by their birth dates. So 970508 means 1997, 5th of May. Okay. Uh, I always remember this burst uh, extremely well because we wrote lots of papers. And my wife sort of minds this because it's also her birthday and it's pretty clear many Freudian slips have occurred, which goes to show which one I remember first. Uh, you know, but honest is the best policy. Uh, so here's a view of uh, 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 Mauna Kea, which is the tallest mountain in uh, uh, the Pacific uh, uh, and uh, in Hawaii, big island of Hawaii. And you can see the Pacific Ocean. And right here on the top, there's almost a billion dollars worth of astronomy capital invested in these telescopes. And these are two telescopes that uh, we jointly operate with the University of California system, the Keck telescopes. And we are able to show by looking at the optical afterglow that this gamma ray burst really came across the universe, you know. And so it is a challenge of how a star can convert, generate so much power in such a short time. Okay, well, having established that uh, for the next few years, uh, life was easy. We are writing a paper almost every two weeks. This is the part I like in astronomy. It's not a hard field, actually. Uh, you sort of, uh, uh, you know, if you're reasonably uh, bright uh, and uh, if you have a reasonable amount of imagination, you can write papers. In other fields, people have to struggle. I mean, I went to a talk in physics. It was terrible. There's this apparently sand pile and person was trying to compute the angle of the sand pile. I thought, oh, well, okay. Uh, okay, sorry. Okay. So... Uh, we are then, uh, we start studying this at radio wavelengths, um, and you know, this is a nice thing with doing astronomy. You, know, you can buzz around, uh, today Australia, tomorrow Puerto Rico, day after Switzerland, who knows? Okay, so anyway, we have telescopes here in the US, in Australia, New Mexico, California, and it's called Very Long Baseline Array. You gang up these telescopes, and you make very fine images. So we, in fact, we're able to make an image of this gamma ray burst. And in fact, uh, we found it, we observed it over a period, and we found it expands faster than speed of light. Um, now, I know that some of you guys may mistakenly think, gee, isn't that like why Einstein got his Nobel Prize? Should we now withdraw that? Well, two things. No, he didn't get the Nobel Prize for saying speed of light is something you can't exceed. And this really didn't exceed speed of light. It's a geometrical trick. Uh, and it's called superluminal expansion. It's been seen in other places. Um, so in a rather short time, uh, many astronomers uh, plus our work, we are able to, in fact, establish the energy scale of this gamma ray burst, uh, uh, and, and in fact, uh, 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 later I will show this is the depth of massive stars. Okay, uh, this is a bit of an in-joke, the next one, so I had to prep you. You know, I didn't grow up in the U.S., I came when I was 21. Uh, and so I don't, some phrases I don't, in, instinctively don't understand, but uh, I read this uh, comic strip and I said, yeah, you know, there's something that makes sense here. So it says this guy, uh, and that's radio source three, oops, that's, uh, okay, that's radio source 3C390.3 and that's radio source 3C231 and over there. It says why radio astronomers often strike out, of course there's a boy and a girl. <laughs> Okay, uh, yeah, so it, uh, I understand, you know, so uh, I, I quickly learned, so uh, I only went to optical observatories when I had uh, such other intentions in mind. Okay, so uh, then, uh, so a little later, uh, you know, most of the stuff I've been doing uh, in our department, mo uh, most of my colleagues, they're very interested in more distant, you know, it's, it's sort of like a, we all have, each community has their, you know, sexy thing, in thing. So the in thing in astronomy for many astronomers are cosmology, very distant things. 
finger of uh, or, or face of God and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but I'm a bit too young to be senile and be interested in cosmology. And uh, uh, so, but I knew, I knew with this discovery that we made something big because as soon as we found this burst and we showed the redshift was 3.4, my colleagues started trooping into my office. Okay, so what was a novelty then now became something of interest. Same thing, burst goes off, uh, we run around, use Palomar, yeah, it's there, not there, rush around, uh, use Hubble, and uh, find that it coincides with the galaxy, use Keck, get a spectrum. So, um, <clears throat> Um, and we showed this is a, a redshift of 3.4. And uh, this got a lot of attention because it turns out if you want to view this as an extreme phenomena, here's a, a timeline for the universe. Uh, <clears throat> and there are several ways you can say what is the temperature of the universe. Basically, it's the energy density, how hot was the universe. We all know the universe today is 3 Kelvin warm. And in the past, it was hotter because it was more compact. So if you go back in time, um, <clears throat> Uh, it'll be hot enough, you know, you're looking at very high temperatures. Here's 10 to the 10 Kelvin, 10 to the 15, 10 to the 20, 25, 30 Kelvin, and here's the time scale, by the way, 10 to the 18 seconds, 10 to the minus 42 seconds. It's an impressive range of uh, 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 phenomena and physics that astronomers explore. So the gamma ray bursts roughly occupied this regime, which is what the universe was within about a uh, few microseconds after birth. So uh, a friend of mine, a colleague, uh, um, suggested we call it as Big Bang 2, which is, I thought it was a bit of uh, a cheat because the Big Bang is an explosion that occurs at all points at the same time. And this is a point explosion. But nonetheless, you know, being practical, I saw this is a great thing. And indeed it was. It got reported about like 300 newspapers. And the part I liked the most was it says, Indian detects Big Bang 2. I like this one. <laughs> and uh, this is right after the Indians had undergone uh, 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 explored the nuclear devices, which only added to the, my sense of humor about these things. Okay, but it, we know we really made it big when here's a German newspaper, you know, um, and somewhere it says Srinivas Kulkarni Das, extreme phenomenon, and so on. And here's a Borderic, uh, shall we say uh, she's uh, scantily clad, and I don't want to be hauled off to a PC tribunal, so it's suitably ex overexposed. And, uh, uh, and there's something about sexual murder, murder. This is like the Pope's uh, guard killed someone the same day. So I thought, well, this is mainstream. Bo Derek, murder, here we are, gamma ray bursts. Okay, so uh, this is the best a scientist can hope, right? I mean, uh, okay, so uh, it's, it's now gamma ray bursts is very much part of a lexicon. Everyone understands what this is. Let's try to now go into and see what is this? Uh, how do you get such large energy, the energy, uh, the power? And uh, theoretically, the idea is that there's some black hole involved. As a, remember, I told you the first thing in the second, third slide that the accretion power, that is when you drop material into a compact object, you also release energy. And the more compact it is, the more you release because it's a small size. What is the most compact object we know? Black hole, in that sense. What is even more compact than a black hole? A rotating black hole. Okay, so if you take an ordinary black hole, like a solar mass, its size is one kilometer. You make it, you rotate it, it's one sixth of a kilometer. You get even six times more energy. In fact, a black hole which is maximally rotating can convert about half of 50%. Uh, that is, if you drop a gram, then one half gram per cent times C squared is the energy released. So black holes, rotating black holes are immense energy so, uh, power generators. Okay, so how do you make rotating black holes? There are two ideas. You have these uh, um, two neutron stars. Uh, we now know that uh, uh, work done by Professor Taylor at Princeton, that you have two neutron stars. They go around each other. They generate gravitational waves. It's a prediction of Einstein's theory of relativity, general theory, and it's been verified through actual pulsar observations. At some point, the, since this system is generating waves, it'll coalesce, form a rapidly rotating black hole, and then through processes we don't fully understand, you get a gamma ray burst, okay? The other one is you start off with a, a large star, much larger star, um, and it's got a small amount of rotation, but remember the famous experiment, I'm sure all of us, were maybe in fifth grade at this point, it's, uh, it's easily done in Ithaca almost 300 days a year. You can do this experiment. You simply go out, put on your skating shoes, anywhere in the parking lot, 
have two dumbbells and you spin around and then withdraw the arms and you spin very fast. Okay, this is the angular momentum conservation. Uh, and so when this star collapses, it becomes a rapidly spinning black hole. Okay, so here's sort of an artist sketch. Here's a massive star, nuclear fusion in the center and uh, black hole is formed, material is now raining on the black hole, jets of matter come out at relativistic, that means very close to speed of light, they pierce through the star and boom, that's where you get the gamma ray burst. And if it's directed towards you, you'll see a very light, bright thing. Now, tempting as it may be, I won't do that because it's actually harmful, but you know, let's look at this laser beam here, right? If you're, uh, if you're looking around the throat of this laser beam, it would be very, very bright. In fact, you would be amazed, you'd think, um, if, it is, if it was really generated by some sort of a heating of a source, it would be very, very hot, okay? But um, this is called collimated uh, beams. So if you're down the throat, you'll see a very bright thing, but if you're away from that, you won't see as much. So gamma ray bursts partly appear to be very bright because they're like laser beams. You're seeing them down the throat, which means for every gamma ray burst you see, there are hundreds, perhaps even a thousand, that are not beamed towards you. Okay, there's another group of gamma ray bursts which is very much in vogue right now. They're called short gamma ray bursts and they come from a different origin. They, in fact, we think, right now it's speculation, we think, in fact, they come from this coalescence of neutron stars. This is a topic of great interest here at Cornell. And uh, um, I, uh, I typically like to write very short papers. It's very hard for me to write a paper uh, over more than a few days. So uh, I like writing letters rather than any tomes. So, uh, that's why I'm showing a picture of nature because my style is such that I, I, once I get inspired or whatever, I get up in the morning, write a paper, and end of, end of it. Um, so you don't really have to pay, you know, it's an excellent way for those of us with ADHD. Okay, so here's a, ga a short gamma ray burst, same thing, you know, uh, it was detected with one satellite. Uh, we used the Chandra X ray satellite, and then uh, we used Hubble Space Telescope and uh, we are able to show that uh, this gamma ray burst came in the outskirts of this otherwise anonymous uh, uh, scraggly galaxy. You know, that's the beauty of astronomy. Can you imagine you sit in your office and you say, yeah, okay, satellite one, get Hubble, Chandra, use the VLA. I mean, it's like, this is fantastic. Astronomy game, boys with toys, the best toys ever. I mean, uh, my pay may be low, but every time I use Hubble, I'm getting like a million dollars of, to of income just, not income, of money someone has spent just for one orbit of Hubble. Maybe it's 10 million, I don't know. So this is a great time to be to doing astronomy because you can really execute these sorts of things which are almost even unimaginable 10 years ago. Okay, so here's another toy. Uh, what we do is, uh, uh, just like this laser beam, except there's a laser beam from Keck we launch and this will be a yellow beam, um, like sodium lined, like the one you see, the sodium lamps, except and we shine it up, and it so happens that uh, every year, roughly actually around this time, there's a broken up uh, comet uh, which uh, seeds a bit of our uh, atmosphere uh, with uh, sodium, amongst other things. So there's a thin layer of sodium, 90 kilometers above. So we shine this light, and the light gets reflected by the sodium layer, and we form an artificial beacon in the sky, 90 kilometers above. And that beacon then serves us to take the atmospheric shimmer. And now this has become pretty routine. So we did this. And uh, in fact, we're able to show that in another case uh, that the gamma ray burst took place in the outskirts of a, what is called as a red elliptical galaxy. There's a galaxy which is some, very different from the previous galaxy I showed. And uh, these indirect clues are all consistent with the idea of this, this uh, two neutron stars which are slowly spiraling and then coalesce. So here's a, here's a, a, a high-quality simulation, and it shows, in fact, a, it should, but maybe because we loaded this movie, uh, it has not been shown. This is a black hole, and there's a neutron star, and what this should have shown in about five seconds, five milliseconds, this would have, in fact, been shredded and, and in fact, uh, uh, would, uh, would uh, reasonably explain the origin of, uh, of the short hard burst. But in the process of two stars going around, as I told you, Einstein's theory of general relativity uh, predicts that, in fact, there should be gravitational waves. It also, but if you're emitting radiation, losing energy, 
it must come at the expense of something, and the two stars get closer because they're getting into the potential well. So you're converting the potential energy into radiation, which means the best way to study this is, in fact, to see the gravitational waves that is predicted by this theory directly. And this is sort of the holy grail of, uh, of, uh, of uh, astrophysics at this point, and uh, the National Science Foundation in the US, the Europeans, they have spent about $500 million putting two instruments, one is called LIGO, the other is called Virgo, to in fact detect gravitational waves uh, directly, which would be you know, a technical coup and a great achievement. Okay, so uh, here's an a, a overview of the LIGO and the Australians are trying to do something in the uh, near Perth. So there's a worldwide effort to finally start seeing this sort of uh, uh, a gravitational waves, uh, it's an esoteric prediction of GR. And astronomers, again, come to the rescue of physicists because this is not an experiment you can do in the lab or at home. You really need uh, these very large objects which are spiraling in, in, a, in this dead spiral, and that's, that's a source of energy. So the next five, 10 years should be very interesting from the point of view of exploring uh, extreme gravity uh, through actual observations. Okay. So um, let me now step back. You know, I sort of gave you a rush of these things where we went from having mysterious gamma ray bursts to actually now coming up and speculating maybe they are the endpoints of certain kinds of stars. They involve very extreme gravity. They may even test some of the uh, finer points of extreme gravity. However, if you just step back and look at this as an astronomical phenomenon, about 100 years ago, astronomers noticed uh, in, they've been noticing before, but the name, uh, 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 the idea of NOVA became uh, very common. So uh, 100 years ago, uh, uh, it was quite fashionable to study a star which uh, uh, suddenly brightened up and then disappeared. And that was called a NOVA stellar, new star, okay? And then it took another 30 years to figure out that what we call is a NOVA stellar, this transient optical source, in fact, is not just one family. In fact, the NOVA and supernova, that is NOVA are a different kind of breed altogether than supernova. And in the NOVA family, now we know there are five kinds of NOVA because they involve white dwarf neutron star black hole and the surfaces. And since a black hole doesn't have a surface, there are five and not six types. And the supernova, it turns out, there are at least two major families, a thermonuclear explosion and a core collapse. So, 100 years ago, what astronomers thought was one name turned out to be many different families uh, with subfamilies and so on. And uh, uh, again, that should give pause. Now, you could, of course, one idea is 100 years ago, people weren't as smart as we are today. Probably not a good assumption, okay? I'm pretty sure they thought that they had found something. So if it turns out, if I tell you gamma ray bursts is not just one family, you should not be surprised. Okay, so. Let's go back, why 100 years? Let's go back only 30 uh, or 40 years ago. Here's Scientific American, somewhere in the 80s, and this was an article on gamma ray bursts. And uh, a famous astronomer who wrote this, uh, and it was a, what's an informed opinion of the masses that gamma ray bursts were galactic objects. They all involved neutron stars. Uh, here's a neutron star undergoing a star quake, a neutron star being hit by a comet, neutron star undergoing a, a, a magnetic flare. And uh, uh, the short answer is we now have found while the majority of the gamma ray bursts of extragalactic, we in fact have examples of a neutron star undergoing a flare. That's a, and mass creates as a gamma ray burst. And uh, we have uh, an example of uh, a neutron star or a black hole accreting matter in chunks. I don't know if it's an asteroid, but something else. So, in fact, it goes to show that ecological niches here are occupied. So let me see if I can, uh, so the next one, uh, hopefully it'll play, so um, uh, play well. Basically, um, uh, I thought uh, uh, there's, a, there's a famous statement by Rumsfeld, and uh, he's actually a deep thinker. You guys may not agree with that, but I thought uh, uh, what he said makes a lot of sense. Let's see if it works. I have no idea how do I. Okay. So let me start again.
Okay. How do I play this? That there are known knowns. There are things we know that we know. There are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we now know we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns. There are things we do not know we don't know. Okay. So, um, of course, the context there was a bit different. He didn't have explosions of the terrest of the uh, cosmic kind, cosmologic or of uh, celestial kind in mind. He was uh, uh, talking of weapons of mass destruction, and uh, so let's see exactly what he says. Because um, okay, so he says uh, reports that say something that has not happened is always interesting to me. Okay, so if you don't find something, it doesn't mean it exists, right? The message is that known knowns, there are things we now know that we know. Supernovae, novi, that's what I think he was saying. There are known unknowns, that is, there are things we now know that we didn't know. So there are extensions of supernovae and novi, and now gamma ray bursts, we didn't know, we now come to know. But there are also unknown unknowns, there are things we do not know, we don't know, and each year we discover a few more of the unknown unknowns. So he's saying things will be found, in fact. Uh, it's a it's a deep statement. Uh, you can, uh, and it's so deep. I've been to several meetings now, and many people like this. Okay, um, so here's the unknown unknown that God discovered after that. So um, we found, in fact, a new kind of uh, uh, explosion here in in the nearby universe, just uh, in in the Virgo cluster. And uh, we only know the name. It just says luminous red novae. It is luminous. It is red, and likely a nova. Okay. And uh, uh, I thought we should come up with a fancy name, but then I found a cartoon, which is uh, about 30 years old now. It says somewhere probably between a nova and a supernova, it is. This object is brighter than nova, but fainter than a supernova. Probably a pretty good nova. So I think maybe we should simply have called it as a PGN. Okay, well, that was a couple of years ago, but Rumsfeld said, remember, every year we'll find a new unknown unknown. Okay, what's, what about recently? Well, uh, now we have to go to radio astronomy. Radio astronomers uh, have been conducting searches for pulsars, the known knowns. It's a mainstream activity. And somewhere along that, they in fact found a very bright radio pulse. It's a bit hard to explain this, but it's got chirp that is sort of has a whistle-like sound, and it's only five milliseconds in, 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 in width, and we believe this is of extragalactic origin. It's clearly an unknown unknown. Uh, the origin of this is highly debated even today. Okay, so the Rumsfeld law for discovery and a new class is true for the last two years, so we assume it's true into the future. I mean, uh, this, is, this is reasonable. So I uh, decided to take that very seriously and started a program called the Paloma Transit Factory which will turn out pretty stamped stuff every night, but with, whole, with a goal of finding one new unknown unknown per year. And this is the concept here is we'll survey the sky, we'll uh, analyze data in real time, and when we find a transient, we'll study them and we'll make progress within the same night. Uh, radio astronomy is, uh, is also poised to do similar things. Here's the Allen Telescope Array in Hat Creek, uh, Northern California, managed by UC Berkeley. And uh, they're using novel technologies and ideas to make large images of the sky and find transients. And in the future, uh, the goal is to do something called a square kilometer array and to find new radio transients. And I'm very, I'm, I think I'm very optimistic. This will be a very exciting field. Uh, there's a law called Moore's Law. Moore's Law tells you that uh, in semiconductor industry, things double every 18 months. That is, uh, your uh, performance, that is, if you pay the same amount every 18 months, you get better performance by a factor of two. Uh, sometimes there's another law or an observation called Kurzweil's law of accelerating returns. I'm not necessarily sure that I believe that. But you can come up with a new law of synergies, actually, which is, if you just had Moore's law, think of just having Moore's law, where only disk capacity increased every 18 months. It won't be so fun. You'll just store more and more pictures. That's all you'll do. Okay. But... If disk capacity increases every 18 months and computing increases every 18 months, then you can do more interesting things like Google's pattern recognition and know, immediately recognizing through your gigabytes of, of data how you want to see uh, who's who. So 
you get only synergy, you get really more multiplicative effect when four or five things have similar cap capabilities. And I think that's what's happening in astronomy. What's we, what we are really now seeing is, due to this large progress outside astronomy, we are getting the synergy of larger computing, very cheap sensors, bandwidth, and then ability to respond instantly because of uh, connectivity. And uh, that's why I think this is a very interesting field. This couldn't have been done 10 years ago for that reason, because one or more would have been missing 10 years ago. And, uh, <clears throat> And that's, that's uh, uh, so I, I, I predict you'll end up seeing lots of interesting things. Now, uh, you know, a, a, talk, a talk like this can be uh, sometimes uh, educational, uh, but uh, uh, it's not guaranteed to be so. So I, I did want to leave you with some, uh, something of value. After all, you spent an hour uh, plus an additional 10 minutes uh, due to our lack of connectivity here. And uh, so uh, let me go back and leave you something very interesting uh, and of great value to you. I assure you, you may forget everything I've told you 10 years from now, but this one, the next thing I'll tell you, you will remember. Okay, you ready for that? Okay, remember I told you that this one of the stellar remnants are neutron stars. Now, a particular kind of neutron star called as pulsars. And uh, <clears throat> so here's an example of a pulsar. Here's a supernova remnant. That means the star exploded. In the center is this neutron star. And this neutron star is slightly special. That is, the neutron stars which have highly, mag they're highly magnetized and they're rotating and they produce pulses of radiation. That's why they're pulsating radio stars or a pulsar. So in this case, there's a pulsar and it has an axis here, if you wish, the north and south geomagnetic or a, uh, or a neutrono magnetic axis. So if you as, so I won't do that, but if you, can, if you imagine me having a light beam in my hand, which is my magnetic pole, and I shine this light on you, then I go around, and then I come back, you'll see a pulse, like a rotating lighthouse. Okay, that's, uh, and then that's what pulsars see, you see a pulse. Okay, and the study of pulsars, mainstream activity right here at, at Cornell, Arecibo Observatory is most famous for that. Okay, so well, uh, what is the thing of value is, that uh, the Australians have, have been really big pioneers in this field. Um, Australia uh, has a similar complex as Ithaca. They feel they're far away, they're very isolated, uh, and so on. And, uh, and actually, some of these AD white uh, observations are right. I think because it's so isolated, in my opinion, uh, the, every time I go to Australia, it's my feeling, you know, these guys are nice, but a little bit on the naive side, I would say. And that's a part of the thing that you have to remember. Okay, so you land in Australia, Sydney, Melbourne, maybe even Perth, okay? And uh, get off the plane, uh, go and uh, cost an Australian. Um, and they're usually nice people. They'll always be very friendly. And they say, hey, look, uh, uh, you know, I attend this talk uh, by this guy, and I want to show you something. Uh, but I need a $50 bill. So you get a $50 bill from this Australian person, okay? And here's a $50 bill. Uh, what he should say, look, here's the Parkes radio telescope, the biggest radio telescope in the southern hemisphere. It was a, a marvel by the time it was constructed, a pioneer in many, many things, including the moon, you know, getting the signal from the moon. How many of you have seen the movie The Dish? Boy, I, Cornell is a very serious place. It's uh, hard to believe. The, the only people who've seen are the faculty. Uh, okay. Anyway, uh, it's a nice movie. It's, a, it's sort of a two-beer movie. You drink two beers, movie's over, okay? <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, and then you say, well, that's a, and it's done a lot of pulsar research, and you can see these are pulsar traces. This is actual real data. These are the pulsar traces, and they actually go up and down, and so on and so forth. And the idea is that by this time you understood so much from a lecture, you actually be able to enthrall them with pulsars, gamma ray bursts, the works, black holes, whatever. And then you utilize the fact that their naive people slowly pocket the $50 and walk away. Okay, on that practical note, and no talk. a naive question, which I'm allowed to ask because I'm an Australian. Um, but but are, are these uh, uh, gamma ray bursts uh, burst at the source, or is it bursty because of a rotating of the rotating whatever? And if so, why don't we see them repeated? 
as we do with pulsars? No, they're not. Uh, we don't believe they're rotating. Uh, so the, the whole phenomenon is over in a very short time. It's at the source. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a cataclysmic it's explosion. A cataclysmic. That's it. Yeah. Now, there are a small fraction of the so-called soft gamma repeaters. They do masquerade as gamma ray bursts, a short gamma ray burst, which, you know, with some study you can figure out. And they do repeat. Uh, and these sort of massive bursts they have maybe once in every 30 years or so. But we know because we've seen them. Can you take a, just by looking at the burst of gamma rays, can you tell what the source of them were? Do you always need secondary observations? In different no. Uh, there's such a wide, the question is, can you just say by looking at the flux and the duration of the gamma ray burst, anything of their origin? It turns out, no, not at all. Uh, there's a, the, the technical term is so-called luminosity function. That is, if you took gamma ray bursts, if you could measure the luminosity at the source itself, how standard they are. Do they have the same wattage? The answer is no. They have wattage which is incredibly diverse. Um, the neutron star lighthouse effect that you were talking about, that doesn't point exactly at the Earth, right? Yes. So how exactly are we seeing these photons if they're pointing some other direction? Only the ones which are beamed. It's called beamed. Only the ones whose geometry is favorable to you. So for every one you, sh you see, there are many you don't. So yeah, so literally, like gamma ray bursts, these opening angles for gamma ray bursts are even more extreme than pulsars. Some of the opening angles for gamma ray bursts are literally that small size. So if you see one, you're very lucky, unless there's a huge conspiracy, right? Then there, the one which is done, pointed that way, you'll never see. So you should say, what is a fraction I will see, that, assuming they all happen isotropically? And the answer may be, as I said, in some cases, it may be as large as 1,000. So every one you see, there are 999 you don't see. So you have to multiply what you see by things you don't see. So when you were saying earlier that uh, gamma rays, just looking at the, the map, seem isotropic, that they're coming from everywhere, um, but yet you, there are still sources, uh, sources of gamma rays that come within our galaxy. Are they just so infrequent that they don't alter the statistics at all? You don't see them on the line of sight of our galaxy? OK. So the question is, what is a typical, what is the rate of occurrence of gamma ray bursts in our galaxy? OK. Uh, and uh, it's a bit actually hard to know what happens locally. We have a much better sense of the rate further away. But it's roughly about a, no less, likely not less than 100,000 years. So once every 100,000 years. Maybe as high as every, once every 10 million years. OK, there are far more gamma ray bursts in, in when the galaxy was younger. We know that. So it's a bit hard to know what it is in some sense as a galaxy has aged. Gamma ray bursts go with, with young stars more than with older stars. Um, and uh, I did tell you something. It's good we don't see these gamma ray bursts directly at sea level. So, um, so let me tell you why that's interesting. Uh, the reason is that if, if you do have a gamma ray burst uh, in our galaxy, OK, and we are so uh, fortunate or misfortunate to have it nicely lined up to receive the brunt of this uh, radiation. Uh, uh, one of the reasons you have to go above Earth's atmosphere is gamma rays don't reach sea level because we have an atmosphere. And the reason is that these gamma rays, they are so energetic photons, they can cleave the bonds, like oxygen, oxygen is bound. So it can actually cleave and make free oxygen. It can also cleave nitrogen, which is a bound molecule, into free nitrogen and so on. And because it takes energy to cleave these bonds, by the time it reaches the sea level, it's all dissipated, which is why we have to actually go up in space to study gamma rays. But if you do have a bright gamma ray burst in our galaxy, then something terrible happens, and maybe not so terrible. And uh, that is, as, as a gamma ray burst uh, progresses and hits the Earth's atmosphere, it'll start cleaving all these bonds, and you get free nitrogen, free oxygen, and so on. And you, very quickly, nitrous oxide is formed so uh, right after gamma ray burst happens, 
uh, there'll be a lot of nitrous oxide, and most of us will die laughing, which is, I think, the best choice we have. I got to tell you that a few people I know, especially in our department, whom for this will have no effect. <laughs> so if you want to wish, if, if uh, I don't know whether you're religious or not, but if you, have a, if you have to take a multiple choice, I would, you have to choose one. Death by whatever, cosmic asteroid hitting. Asteroids, terrible stuff. Don't go for that. It's, it's, it's really bad. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I would simply go for gamma ray bursts. <laughs> <laughs>